So in that video, we're sort of making light, exaggerating a little bit about what this two-part mini-series is all about. Because I think all of us, sometimes we can get really busy doing really good things, right? I think sometimes we can become deeply passionate or maybe swept up into an issue or a cause that we feel like we've got to have an influence in. You know, we've got to make an impact. And when we find that cause, we often want everybody else to join in with us. Like we don't understand why everybody else doesn't or isn't as passionate as we are. And I think often, like, that's what this series is about. It's what we talked about last week. We, we honestly want to, we want to try to love our neighbors as ourselves, right? See, see, and I think sometimes, though, and I think that was the funniest part in, in that video, at least for me, is, like, they're, they're loving their neighbors. They don't even know the guy's name that lives right next door, let alone you know, realized that he needed some help. So last week, your campus pastors challenged you to know the people right next door. Whether it's in your apartment building or your dorm or the housing development you live in. And we took a look at one of Jesus' most famous teachings. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. In the story, Jesus is helping us understand a couple things. One is that there's always going to be a lot of causes and needs and injustices and wrongs in the world that we should be concerned about. However, to understand truly loving our neighbor as ourself, we must be concerned about the people that he's placed in our immediate proximity, the people that we encounter every day at work or at school or right out the front door. Because there's always going to be noble causes to pursue, but in our pursuit, we can't neglect the people that he puts right in our path every single day. We cannot look over, we cannot move to the other side of the road and ignore our neighbors. And last week, we, we took a look at this concept of like, why? Because, like, I mean, I think everybody, when I was just talking there, you, you get it, right? We should love our neighbors as ourselves. We should get to know the people that are in our circles of relationships. We get that in our heads, but isn't it sometimes hard to move that into our heart and act on it? And we talked about why. Why don't we act on this? If we get it, why don't we do something about it? And one, we said it's busyness, right? We talked about the fact that sometimes we just don't have any margins in our schedule. We're so busy, we don't talk to our neighbors. We don't know their names. We don't know what they do. We don't really know much about them. So how can we know when there's a difficulty happening in their life? We talked about for some of us, it's fear. Like we're taught from a young age, like stranger danger, right? We hear something horrible that somebody does, a crime on the, on the news, and they always interview the neighbor, and the neighbor says, he's a pretty normal dude. Like I can't believe this. So it makes us sometimes a little fearful of who might be living right next door. And then isolation, right? I think instead of maybe getting out in the front yard, getting out on our porch, engaging our neighbors, we tend to you know, head into the garage, shut the door, and head to the back deck. We enjoy sometimes isolating ourselves from people. And in Jesus' story, the good Samaritan who found the beaten man along the roadside, he had a choice. He could keep on walking, or he could stop and help. And unlike the priest and the Levite who walked to the other side of the road and went on by, we learned that loving our neighbors as ourselves involves the willingness for all of us to wade into the mess of the people that Jesus puts right in our path. You know, at Christmas time, right? I love to donate a toy to, to a toy drive. I love to, like, get a warm coat, you know, for... Some, somebody in need. Those are really great things to do. But like, let's be honest, there's no mess in that. There's no relational exchange. See, we acknowledge that loving the people right next door is sometimes tough. It's, it's messy. But man, Jesus wasn't making it an option. He calls us, he commands us to do it. And it requires more than just knowing their names and waving a friendly hello when you pull into your driveway. So here's the big question. Did you do it this week? Did you make an attempt to get to know your neighbors or those people that Jesus has placed right in your path? It seems like almost every day, finding out who they are and what they're doing and begin to build a friendship. 
See, we put this series together maybe, I don't know, a month or two, a couple months ago. And in part two, my task is to talk to you about what do you do with, I'm just going to use this frame, not easy neighbors, right? Like difficult people that are in your path and that are around you all the time. Because my guess is that some of you, even last week, you know, or so far what I've been talking about today, you're saying like, I know Scott, I know that I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, but you don't know my neighbor. You don't know what I got to deal with. And some of you are like, I know I'm supposed to love the people that God has placed in my circles of friendships. I get it, the places where I live and where I work and where I play. But Scott, there's some unlovable people that reside there. Like, like, man, Scott, like their beliefs, their language, their behavior, their morals, it makes it almost impossible for, for me to want to love them. And I like, if we're really honest with each other here today, I think there's probably some of you that are just saying, I don't want to love them. Yeah, I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to associate with them. And I get that. A couple things. One, that's not biblical, though. And secondly, probably more importantly, you were most likely a not easy neighbor at some point in your life. And somebody loved you as they would themselves. So, so I prayed through this topic. I've studied some different texts from Jesus and the Apostle Paul. And I want to talk about it. I believe that we can, we can do this. It's, it's difficult at times to love our not easy neighbors, but we can whether it's at your work or at your gym or maybe it's an in-law or, you know, somebody that is literally right next door, the difficult people. But however, as I was pulling this sermon together, you know, God pushed me in a direction that I had not intended to go. And, and the more I fought it, the, the more I, I just didn't, he would not allow me to release it or even soften it. The more I thought and prayed about this, the more I came to this really clear realization and it's this, when I think about the not easy neighbors in my life, maybe in my past, when I recall the times that I have been treated extremely disrespectful, the, the times when people's words have left scars, the times where people have talked behind my back, those times and those people have been Christians. It's not been the atheist or the agnostic or the Muslim or the Hindu or the Jew in the places where I live, work, and play that have said the most disrespectful, aggressive, belligerent things to me personally. It's, it's been my fellow God followers. And I, I love Jesus and I love the church and I say this often that I believe the local church is the hope of the world. But if we can't get this right, see, if we cannot be in right relationship with one another as fellow Christ followers, how are we going to do this with the people that are not Christ followers? Why do we do this to one another as Christians? See, see before God followers can, can begin to deal with the not easy neighbors in our lives, we need to work on the way that we treat the brothers and sisters in Christ in our lives. If you're a follower of Jesus, your primary responsibility is to love people, not be right. If the first thing we need to do is love people, then why is it also the first thing we forget when we get into a passionate disagreement or we're passionate about a view or a point? And I just want to add a couple things here. I, I, I call these like please hear me points. Sort of these are, th these are things I'm not saying, just, just to, to, to make it really clear. I'm, I'm not saying that a fellow believer should not challenge me if he or she feels like I am morally cutting corners or I am theologically out of bounds. But please hear me, I'm, I'm not saying that Jesus' followers should not be passionate about ideas and issues that are worth fighting for. But I just believe there's something wrong with Christianity when we are known more for our arguments and our judgments than we are for our love. At times I, I think we've forgotten who we are. We're not about points, we're about people. We value people, not positions. We, we, we can't love our neighbors as ourselves until we remember who we are and whose we are. 
We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And we are commanded to love other believers well. So that in doing that, we can reveal the Father's love to a world that desperately needs a Savior. I think our world talks quite a bit about tolerance and acceptance. We, we, we value passion and conviction around ideas. But all too often, what I see is we only value the things that line up with our perspective or our worldview. What I see a lot lately is how nasty and one-sided and closed-minded our world can be. The world seems so divided. I just think the thing that saddens me most is that often I don't see a big difference in the behavior between Christians and non-Christians. Our conversations used to be about connection. How can I connect with you? What can I mutually learn from you? And they seem to have turned more into scorecards. Like who won that argument? Who lost that debate? I just think it's sad and I think it should bother us. And, and last, like please hear me. This is my last of the please hear me. I, I love good robust conversations, right? Uh, disagreements, you know, a good debate. But why has it become so disrespectful? And so often amongst believers. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, was a man that once disrespected Christians. I'd be putting it mildly. He hated Christians. He, he had earlier followers of, of Jesus arrested and sometimes even executed for simply believing in Jesus. He was bright, he was powerful, he was important, and he was climbing the religious ladder when Jesus had an encounter with him, spoke truth to him, loved him, and turned his whole life around. In Acts 17, we find the Apostle Paul in the city of Athens. And a man that once hunted those that believed in Jesus is now pursuing those that don't know Jesus in love. And as he walks around this city of Athens, he sees idols and altars to gods everywhere. Like, like almost on every corner, there's, a, there's an altar over here for the god of the, of the sun. And over here, there's an altar for the god of rain. And there's statues that are you know, depicting images of warrior gods and peace gods. And then he comes across one that's actually dedicated to the unknown god. Because, see, the Greeks, they placated to all gods. And I guess that they constructed this particular altar in case they missed one, right? It's like they would, like people would enter their city. Well, why you visit our fair city, just in case we fail to mention or honor your particular god, we have sort of this catch-all over here, this unknown god one. See, see Paul, while he's in Athens, he gets invited um, to a group, to a meeting, to a conversation where some people are going to talk about philosophy and, and religious ideas. And at the meeting, Paul says, men of Athens, like I can see you're bright religious people. Like you got these gods and altars everywhere. It says that he actually quoted some of their sort of famous poetry back to them. And he tells them, hey, I, I came across this altar in the city that's, that's set aside for the unknown God. And he says, if I may, I'd like to introduce you to the unknown God. And he tells them about Jesus. Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. And at the end of the conversation, it's recorded, it says this. Now, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. Some made fun. But some of them said, I want to hear more about this Jesus. So I encourage you, go and read Acts 17. Re read that section. Two things sort of jumped out at me as, as I read it, read it. One is, this is like obvious, but Paul knew people that disagreed with him. Like it's just obvious to me that he knew a lot of people that, that disagreed with him. 
See, I think in our day, we tend to cluster around people that think and believe the same way that we do. And secondly, Paul respected their ideas with intelligent conversation. He didn't send them a nasty email ahead of time to be read to the group, right? He didn't come into that meeting just guns blazing. See, conversation, it's mutual learning. Conversation is listening. You are not learning anything when you're doing all the talking, right? If you leave a conversation that you did all the talking, you didn't learn anything. See, why do we struggle with our not so easy neighbors? I, I think a couple things. One is we don't practice enough because we avoid them. We walk to the other side of the road. We, we prefer to cluster with those that agree with us. And the second reason th that I think we struggle with engaging in our, with our not so easy neighbors is often we go into the conversation and our number one objective is to be right versus to be in right relationship. You know, on my last trip to, to Southeast Asia, I spent a few days in a particular state that was extremely hostile to Christianity. Um, this area was majority Muslim. It had a small percentage Hindu, and the Christian church was literally not there. And, and if it was, it was, it was underground. And it was against the law to evangelize for Christ. And, and there's a Northway Mission Partners that, that we have resourced and supported for years have spent years building trust and strong relationships on the ground in that area. And on one day, they set up a series of meetings for me to have conversation with some young Muslim students and young adults. And because of the trust that our mission partner had built up with the community in that area, they obtained for the day what is called a PTC from the local Muslim leaders. And a PTC is permission to convert, which meant I was permitted to speak freely about Jesus and my faith in these conversations with these young men and women. I learned that a lot of the kids that I met that day, kids, these young 20s and early 30s, they, they had no fathers because they had been lost in religious wars and terroristic activity. Th these young men and women were, were part of a growing alliance of youth that, that want a different future, one that desires peace and hope. I, I learned from them in this conversation that they connect Christianity with Western culture. So, so when they think Christian, they, they think Western culture. They think what they see on TV and in movies and what they read about. So when they think Christians, they think rich Americans that are loud, aggressive, and arrogant. And what I learned in this conversation is that they believe Christians, because connecting with Western culture, they believe that to be a Christian, you're, you're just about money, guns, and pornography. They, they spoke great English. This is one group I talked to. They, they shared stories of their childhood with me, their, their faith and their hopes for the future. I had the opportunity to show them some pictures of my family, to tell them stories about what it was like for me growing up, and to tell them how Jesus got a hold of me as a teenager and changed my life forever. You know, at the close of our conversation, one young man came over to me and he said a couple things that will stick with me forever. And he said this, he said, from now on, when I hear the word Christian, I'm going to think of you. And I said, and I've been trying so hard to do this, every time I hear the word Muslim, I'm going to think of you. And the last thing he said to me was, hey, will you come back someday so we can talk some more? I hope I get to do that. Do you know what you have every day when you wake up in this country? PTC, permission to convert. See, are you engaging not easy neighbors in a conversation? Are you engaged in mutual learning and listening with people that might disagree with you? Are you changing the perception that people have of Christians? Are you sharing 
love with people so that they can see Jesus Christ in you. You do not have to travel across the world to do it. You know, it, it starts with how we engage fellow believers and then it moves out to the people that are right next door. Permission to convert is never disrespectful. It doesn't know it all, it's not aggressive, and it starts with love. See, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus, he invites this despised tax collector, a man named Matthew, to leave his business behind and to follow him, and Matthew does. And I love the, the, the account, it says that the next thing that Matthew does, um, it's found in, in Matthew 9, the next thing that Matthew does, he throws a party. He invites all his tax collectors and sinners to the party, and he also invites Jesus. And Jesus goes to that party where there are going to be a lot of not easy neighbors. And at that party, Jesus had PTC, right? He had permission to convert. And what does he do at that party? I don't sense that he did any finger wagging, disrespectful, yelling, anything. In fact, from the text, I can see that he ate, he drank, and he lounges with them. And my guess is he engaged in conversation that focused on connecting, listening, and learning. And he called them to himself with love. I'm always amazed when reading the scriptures, people sought Jesus out, right? The tax collector, which would have been an enemy of a rabbi. Zacchaeus climbs a tree just to get a look at him. A Pharisee, people that did not like Jesus. Man, and Nicodemus comes to him in the middle of the night just to have a conversation with Jesus. A man with leprosy, considered to be unclean, not permitted in public. He sets aside his shame and he drops himself at the feet of Jesus to have a conversation. People that culturally would not have associated with Jesus pursued him. And in every case, regardless of the differences, Jesus associated with them. Is that happening in your life? Like there's nothing that gives me more joy than someone that is far from God that I've gotten to know, maybe he or she is going through something a little difficult and they come to me and ask to have a conversation. Is that happening in your life? See, I will take that conversation any day over debating politics or the current cultural hot buttons or theological non-essentials. You know, like, the rapture, are you pre-trib or are you post-trib? He's coming back. That's what I know. I just don't want to argue the non-essentials. The Apostle Paul in Romans 12, he, he basically answers the question, how do we get along with not easy neighbors? Four verses, six thoughts. He says this, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord." Six, four verses, six sort of key points. He said, bless those who persecute you. Our persecution is different than Paul's persecution of the day. Our persecution is different than some of the countries that I've been. Our persecution is often someone treating you badly because of what you believe in. Someone being a, a, a jerk is sometimes is, is the, the extent of our persecution. just want to ask you when that's happening, has Jesus changed your life enough for you to remember it in those difficult conversations? The next time you're having a conversation about faith and someone gets really personal, maybe he's in a little bit of a jerk with you, can you bless them in their bluster? You know, I love this quote. I don't even know where it's from. It's, I've seen it everywhere, though. It says, be kind because everyone you know is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. Sometimes when someone's really coming at me hard, I just wonder, like, what's going on? I wonder what's happening with them. Well, I wonder what difficulty they're experiencing for them to react this way to me. Well, where has someone hurt them or the church hurt them? And how can I bless them in that bluster? It said rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Basically, Paul is saying here, be real, be a real friend. Some of us do not have enough real friends 
Some of us have a lot of people in our lives that we know what they think and we know what they post and we call them friends, but they don't don't really know what they're feeling and they don't really know what we're feeling. And maybe some of you are saying, Scott, that's sort of the way I like it. Like, I don't know if I want all that many people knowing my feelings and I don't know if I really want that many people that I need to know their feelings, right? I don't know if I want that many. Can I just ask you a question? Why are you arguing with them then? If you're not willing to rejoice and to weep with them, stop arguing with them. Live in harmony, he said. Harmony is not this unison and mindless agreement. After Paul spoke in Athens, some mocked him and others wanted to hear more. When you get through talking about Jesus, harmony is present when the person says, okay, I think I want to hear more. I'm not sure I agree with all that. But I think I'd like to hear more. I think so often what we want to be is pot stirrers. We want to be bomb throwers. We want to be mic droppers. Right? We want a conversation. We get in there and and say what we feel is right. And then we just exit the conversation. That's not harmony. Harmony is mutual learning and listening. It says, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. What, What does that mean? Basically, it means you don't know it all. I don't really have too much to add to that, right? Nobody likes a know-it-all. You have no idea what you can learn from a not easy neighbor or somebody that you disagree with, right? You have no idea what you can learn. Don't pay back evil with evil, right? You you know, you're going to run into evil people in your life. But, But evil doesn't mean different. An evil person is not somebody that's just different than you. They're different. They believe something different. They're not evil. If you run across somebody evil, just respectfully exit the conversation. Don't give evil people access to your heart. But don't confuse evil with different. Lastly, he said, do all that you can to make peace. This is so simple. When you're wrong, say you're wrong and apologize. See, our mission as a church is to be a church that loves people where we live, work, and play. And our vision is to impact the Pittsburgh region with the hope of the gospel. And that love begins with how we treat our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's got to start there. And when it starts there, the gospel of Jesus can and will impact the Pittsburgh region. As a church, we're a community in Wexford. We're a community in Oakland. We're a community in the Swickley Valley, in East End, in Dormont, and in Beaver Valley. We have six locations where we have the opportunity to first and foremost love each other well. We reveal to a world how Christians are to treat one another. And then we have the most unbelievable opportunity to impact your neighborhood, your community, by loving our neighbors, right? as we would ourselves. So Father God, I would just ask for your blessing on these six locations. God, would you help us be good neighbors? We lift this up in your son's name. Amen.